Thank you all very much, um, ladies and gentlemen. If you would take your seats, please, and uh, we get underway. It's just, just after one o'clock. Um, you're all very welcome. My name is Alex White, Director General of the Institute of International European Affairs, and I'm really, really delighted to um, welcome you all, and in particular, um, the colleagues uh, or colleagues for the day uh, from Deloitte, Ireland, uh, for working with us on uh, planning and organising with my our colleagues here in the Institute, planning and organising uh, this event, which I'm quite sure is going to be a if 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 the, some of the discussion we've had in the lead up to it are anything to go by a really interesting and stimulating uh, occasion and we have a terrific panel so thank you for being here thank you in particular to Deloitte um, and it's just my only other role is uh, to introduce the chair for this session we have a terrific chair Liz Carolyn is the tech and democracy strategist and advocate frankly we couldn't have a better chair, a um, more appropriate chair for what we want to talk about today. Um, Liz has held roles at the Open Data Institute, the African Governance Initiative and the Institute for Government. We're delighted to say that she's on our digital strategy group here at the IIEA and we're delighted to have her in that context, but in particular, delighted to have you today to chair this session and the floor is now yours. Thank you Thank very much, Liz. Thanks so much, Alex, and welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out on this absolutely miserable day. Um, it's great to see a packed room for um, what I think is going to be a fantastic discussion. Um, I'm very excited about this topic, um, in part because I have no expertise in it. <laughs> so I get to um, learn along with the rest of you here. So I'm going to be guiding us through the next 75 minutes, making sure that we're all out the door at 2.15. I know we've all got a lot going on. Um, and I think, um, so I, I, I until recently kind of founded and led an organization that was looking at, um, as Alex said, tech and democracy. And I found in that kind of, you know, in, in these leadership roles, like half of your brain has to be on thinking, what's next? Where is this going to go? Where is the next challenge coming from? What are we going to be doing in five and 10 years time? You know, my board wanted a strategic plan. I had to figure out how much money to be asking people for. And then the other half of my brain is, okay, well, who am I going to hire? Um, because it takes six months to get somebody in post. What am I actually going to put in the budget for next year? Um, how do I write this bloody strategic plan that everybody <laughs> that everybody keeps um, asking me for? And to me, that dissonance, I think, between those two parts of any leadership role, and possibly even more so, I think, in the realm of, um, of security, which is, our, which is our focus point here today, is where I'm hoping that today's discussion will give us all some um, insight and uh, hopefully I'm hoping to come away with some tools and practical tips as well as just some of these I think really interesting conceptual ideas um, which I know that you are all um, at, at the heart of working on and it is as I said such um, an absolutely brilliant panel and if we look at you know what what's happening on, on the security front on, on the security front today you know I, I don't need to tell this group everything that's been happening um in in ukraine in 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 russia's war of aggression against ukraine we have all of the emerging technology threats what's happening in ai um quantum computing um you know like just like um um ad, 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 advances in in robotics um, and then there's obviously the you know the 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 climate the the, the climate challenge um, and what that will mean for for security and you know I, I was even thinking this morning about you know like listening um, listening to to the, the the UK Justice Secretary over the last few days talking about well actually do we need to tear up the entire approach that we have as a globe to displacement of people and to mass movement because of what's coming down the line like these are very um, very real discussions and debates which have people at the heart of them um, and which I think are going to be a part of our lives for, for a long time to come. Um, so I am super excited to be hearing from this panel. Um, I, I'll, I'll introduce them just, just very, very briefly um, before I then kind of hand over. So um, we have um, uh, Dr. Raluca um, uh, Chernatoni. <laughs> I was practicing that on the Lewis on the way here. Um, she's, a, she's a fellow at Carnegie Europe, she specializes in European security and defense. Um, and in emerging disruptive technologies, which is exactly what we need as part of this debate today. She's also a professor uh, of European security and counterterrorism at the Brussels School of Governance. Um, so we're going to be hearing from Dr. Luca first, um, and then we'll be hearing from Dr. Eamon Noonan um, of the um, uh, EPRS Policy Foresight Unit. And um, they've been involved in um, inter-institutional ESPAS network, European Strategy Policy Analysis Systems since 2015. Um, you've recently returned from a, from an EU fellowship at um, at St Anthony's um, over in Oxford, and as an Irish diplomat, you were in Luxembourg and Norway, 
Um, so again, bringing tons of experience. And I think a lot of that kind of European perspective for us as well, um, which is obviously um, a, a, a core part of all of our future. And then Dr. Um, Florian Klein, uh, you founded and lead, and, and, and you now lead the Center for the Long View, uh, which is part of Deloitte's Global Center for Excellence um, for Scenario Planning and AI-Enabled Sensing. Um, and so Florian, you've ordered several books on mega trends um, and on designing strategic decision-making systems. So I think we're really spanning the gamut here, um, both of um, thinking domestically, thinking Europe, European, I think globally and across some of those threats. And um, Dr. Raluca, but, but before I turn to, to, to you, you, you were talking um, a little bit before about how we have this sort of triple thing of technological disruption, geospatial disruption, climate disruption. Um, so, I mean, I, I think for, for me that the the technological bit is is, is where I'd love to love love you to start. And so, like, I mean, are we already living in an AI disrupted future? <laughs> um, and and what is that going to mean? Um, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for for how we think about planning for what we're doing now in terms of planning for that future? Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a very tough topic and the tough question. Uh, and I suggested in a way the, the broader lines of this um, question, I do not have the answer. That's the, the, the first punchline. Um, the fact that we are def uh, definitely witnessing uh, disruptions, disruptions when it comes to technology, uh, geopolitics, um, climate, uh, all um, sectors of society. But my uh, bread and butter, of course, is this nexus between emerging and disruptive technologies. And we already heard about the, the, all the buzzwords, quantum, AI, uh, big data. Uh, now we are talking as well about chips, semiconductors, undersea cables, critical raw materials, uh, all these uh, technologies that have been um, uh, in a way framed as combining and engendering a mega trend. And we already have a name for that, the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, this is something that I'm really interested in, but especially uh, when it comes to the impact of some of these technologies on security and defense. Um, when it comes to my work at Carnegie, um, I'm more interested in the current uh, policy landscape and governance la landscape at the EU level and NATO. And of course, both uh, institutions have been focusing on emerging and disruptive technologies. And we have laundry lists of <laughs> emerging and disruptive technologies and prioritizing. But uh, in um, uh, the last couple of uh, six, uh, let's say in the last six months, I focused a lot on artificial intelligence and artificial artificial intelligence enabled disruption. And um, when it comes to strategic foresight and artificial intelligence, I would say that we are already uh, dealing with a lot of the disruptive uh, effects of how these technologies are being mainstreamed in every sector of our society. Uh, you all know about the recent hype about artificial intelligence, uh, it's, uh, large language models, generative AI, uh, who is leading this conversation, of course, and the fact that policymakers and governments are lagging behind or needing to align with all these very fast-paced uh, trends that are transforming, uh, again, the way we produce knowledge, the way we communicate. But this also deals with issues, for instance, uh, when it comes to controlling the communicational landscape, who sets the agenda, how are these types of technologies disrupting democratic processes, how such technologies are enabling our general purpose. AI systems, of course, are general purpose um, uh, enabling technologies that can be deployed both in civil and military sectors. But uh, for the purpose of this panel, I was also reflecting about strategic foresight. And um, I remember the stroll I had in Washington DC, actually this spring uh, on the Pennsylvania Avenue, I was heading towards the museum quarter and I was passing uh, by the National Archives building. And there are two statues there. One is the future and the other one is the past. The future is depicted as a young woman and um, under the... Uh, kind of the, the punchline for, for the statue is the, the fact that the past is prologue. Uh, uh, when it comes to the past, of course, uh, past, we always need to learn uh, the past to know the future. So it's almost like a um, um, circular logic here. But what struck, uh, strikes me as really interesting as well, without necessarily being path dependent and being deterministic when it comes to trying to divine how certain technologies will transform our lives from high politics to law politics, from security and defense, to educational system, democratic processes, I think that there is a lot of insight also into uh, looking at the past and how other disruptive technologies have uh, transformed um, um, 
various stages of industrial revolutions. Now we are witnessing actually uh, the fourth one, uh, supposedly. Um, but when it comes to artificial intelligence, of course, um, EU and uh, as I said, the UN and the NATO have been uh, spear spearheading various initiatives, either on the research and innovation side with Horizon Europe, but we have also initiatives and projects under the European Defense Fund and its precursor programs that focus on AI technologies. Uh, NATO as well. But for me, where interestingly at, at the moment is the conversation surrounding uh, generative AI and the research actually development and deployment of generative AI systems and when it comes to uh, their safety, ethics and accountability. So when it comes to strategic foresight, we uh, definitely always focus on the emerging disruptive aspects on the technical aspect aspects of the conversation. But for me, actually the, the foresight or the uh, strategic foresight conversation should be actually about broader resilience. This came up during our lunchtime, actually. Um, again, uh, other conversations surrounding emerging and disruptive technologies have been associated with the fact that Europe is lagging behind, that we are experiencing gaps. Um, and this, uh, these gaps, of course, manifest themselves in a lack of strategic autonomy. We heard about technological sovereignty, digital sovereignty. Um, nowadays, we hear about economic security. All these issues are really important because in terms of identifying gaps and dependencies, um, it's also a matter of trying to understand Understand the state of play at the moment, but also trying to project towards the future, where to invest, where to prioritize, what to emphasize for sure. When it comes to the hybridization of warfare, the growing hybridization of warfare, we see lessons learned also from Ukraine. We see civilian technologies, even AI off-the-shelf technologies being bricolaged, used uh, during um, times of conflict. These types of present day uh, insights uh, also can be projected towards the future. Again, a leadership in advancing AI power technologies, again, will be a significant um, a step forward when it comes to security and defense capabilities, and also in terms of what to prioritize when it comes to European defense technological and industrial base. Um, I have actually a couple of um, punchlines again when it comes to um, dual use security and defense AI, um, and uh, some points to, to think about. I think that when it comes to military AI, however you want to define it, you need, first of all, to explore the concept of disruption in the context of uh, military um, affairs, um, how it might potentially incrementally um, change processes, strategies, tactics, and operations. Um, some, some experts say that uh, it is already paradigmatically shifting and shaping the ways of doing warfare. For me, uh, really understanding what is exactly emerging, what is disruptive is very important, and being clear on uh, the definitions and the taxonomies is, uh, again, uh, a priority area for which actually the European Defense Agency has worked on with the European uh, um, a taxonomy on AI, military AI. Then we need to also try to understand the realities and myths related to algorithmic driven warfare from fielding such technologies to impact, but also when it comes to issues of international governance um, and international law. What does it mean, uh, for instance, to deploy such systems uh, when it comes to uh, human uh, humanitarian law and uh, human rights for that matter? Uh, then we also need to explore the vectors for international and European confidence building measures measures for AI and for dual use AI, not only civilian conversations, but also uh, military conversations, uh, and also to include uh, different stakeholders in this conversation. So it shouldn't be just state led, but we have to also engage with civil society, academia, um, and also the private sector. Uh, and also trying to understand what do we uh, mean by uh, the so-called arms race in AI and why the EU is lagging behind and now we are pitted against this sino american and competition when it comes to such systems, then not to mention other buzzwords that were the realm of science fiction before, but we see now more and more as a reality, lethal autonomous weapon systems, uh, the so-called killer robots. And finally, assessing the ethical implication, the human rights standards, legal frameworks, and public perceptions. And this came up also during our lunch in terms of the public discourse when it comes to deploying dual use AI systems. So this is more the military side of the conversation, and maybe I will turn really quickly on the current hype surrounding generative AI. And I must confess that I have been very puzzled 
about this hype. And I will just read to you a couple of titles that were circulated in popular media surrounding generative AI like ChatGPT or Bard, and now we have uh, Amazon and Claude and uh, Anthropic. So I quote, ChatGPT poses an existential threat and the window for gaining control over it is small. How can an AI with no concept of right or wrong be allowed to make moral decisions without explicit guidance, says the title in the Irish Times. So here note the existential threat framing. In the same apocalyptic vein, New York Times reports that AI poses risks of extinction. Noting that industry leaders from OpenAI, Google's DeepMind, Anthropic, and other AI labs warned that future systems could be as deadly as pandemics and nuclear weapons. The Washington Post, no less, states that ChatGPT maker OpenAI calls for AI regulation, so industry calling for AI regulation, warning of existential risk. Of course, we have other voices from the Future AI um, Institute, um, uh, warning again um, against uh, the existential nuclear level extinction level risks of generative AI. Such such titles for me are really indicative of the current state of play and a really disentangling between hype, buzz, but also in a way a very securitized and very dangerous apocalyptic catastrophic type of imagery and narrative. And I think that here in terms of trying to also navigate the fog of the future, another term that I really liked because I hear a lot the fog of war, uh, Clausewitz being complicated by emerging technologies. Um, uh, when it comes to kind of trying to navigate that, we also need to try to understand or try to make sense of the noise. We have a lot of noise surrounding us. Uh, when it comes to deploying some of these systems, for instance, in military um, in military settings, you need to have technological readiness le level, cybersecurity, a really a strong due diligence testing out of such of technologies, even if they are off the shelf, for instance. There are other conversations, of course, related yet again again, to more the governance issue, the human rights issue, and so on. But maybe I will just um, 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 close with, uh, actually, again, two quotes. Um, last week, we had uh, the speech from um, uh, President of the Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, that actually mirrored almost identically um, this catastrophic risk, existential risk, risk framing that we have seen in uh, popular discourse. And for me, that's very, um, again, indicative of how some of these imaginaries are now going into governance and policy making. So I will quote here, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks, such as pandemics and nuclear war. So it's very fascinating to see how uh, to see how an AI disruptive future actually is more and more painted, not in beneficial terms, but actually in very uh, negative and uh, dire doom and gloom scenarios. And it comes as no surprise, but because even the Godfather, the so-called Godfather of AI, and former former Google um, uh, vice president uh, Geoffrey Hint actually uh, noted uh, yet again uh, the dangers of a uh, potential super intelligence. And this is the last word and my quote um, from the godfather of AI. It's quite conceivable that humanity is just a passing phase in the evolution of intelligence. So <laughs> this is open for conversation and whether we want that intelligence to decide life and death during the battlefield and in combat situations. So thank you very much and looking forward to, to the questions. Thank you so much, um, and thank you for keeping perfectly to time. Um, and it, it just, I, I have one nagging question in my head, which is who did the PR for that letter? Like the coverage and the impact that that open letter has had has been absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal. Um, and also this is why um, uh, political computer, computer science um, um, undergrads need to study philosophy and, yes. <laughs> and the humanities and social sciences, but that's my, um, that's my book there. Amen. We're going to hand over to you. And I think we had some nice segues into um, what you're going to talk about. I mean, I think you're you're going to help us ground a lot of this in 
so, so what is already happening at, at European level? Um, how is this all starting to relate into um into the, 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 the security realm and field? Um, and also I, I think you're gonna help us kind of understand like, well, okay, so what is this strategic foresight? thing <laughs> we which we have all come in here today uh to have a think about so Eamon, i'm gonna hand yep. over to you and, and and likewise i'll 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 give you a little warning when we're getting towards the end yes. um yeah thanks very much so it's um i'm not at all intimidated by the breadth and depth of expertise sitting in front of me and um i have some uh, cheat sheets here so you'll forgive me for referring to them from from time to time and i'll start with definition and purpose a little bit and then i'll talk about the eu experience i'm nervous to a little bit nervous about moving on to the domain of security and the ins and outs of security policy again considering the expertise this is not my area of expertise uh, but i can share at least some perspectives based on a uh, kind of a secure, a strategic foresight point of view uh, that might help inform the, the 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 emerging debate in Ireland. The word strategy uh, comes from Greek strategoi. Who was a strategoi? It was a member of the Athens War Council. So strategy, in its origins, comes from the military domain. One of the members of this council, so one of the first strategoi, was Thucydides, the great historian, great hero of mine. So just that's just a, a, a by the way, definition of security of of strategic foresight is um, it's a structured consideration of different possible futures. So we accept immediately there are several different ways, paths, uh, things can go. Uh, there's not one. That would be a fundamental mistake to think there's, we're going in one direction. That's where we're going. We have to account for and consider several different outcomes and a structured consideration that is you know, using analytical tools and techniques. Um, the the purpose of it there's a clever uh, expression there foresight it's an effort to relate today's events to yesterday's facts in a way that can help enlighten tomorrow's pathway um the uh, purpose is uh, um therefore to kind of cast light on the future in so much in so much as we can all our data is from the past all our decisions are about the future and this is a big um, bridge between those two domains. I would make one suggestion at this point. One is that don't do strategic foresight if you don't mean it. And that means, uh, particularly, I'd like to draw a distinction between strategic foresight and strategic planning. We touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, strategic planning is finding the right path to your desired goal. But you've already made your decision about strategy. You've already determined your strategy. Strategic foresight is about strategy Preparation. If you have already made your decision about what you're doing, then you then that's not the time for strategic foresight. So strategic foresight has to be early in the policy process, early in the strategy process, because you're preparing uh, a strategy and a bunch of policies that you hope will mesh mesh together. Uh, it needs to be very early in the in the stage of policy de design and preparation. Um, the the uh, next point is that uh, what is going on, what has been going on at the EU level. So we hear the expression permacrisis, polycrisis, omni um, and that's been going around for a while from at least the financial crisis 2008 and before that as well. Uh, and the EU every time has been in a process of responding to the latest crisis. The EU actually can point to a quite a good record on how it responds to crisis. It manages to stick together. It manages to pull together when it's really important. It manages to get through. That's been the historic record. Mightn't always be the case, but that's been the record. Uh, but there's a strong sentiment, and there has been at least since the financial crisis, that we need to move to anticipatory governance. And that's trying to think, what is the next crisis? What can we? What do we need to do to prepare for future crises so that we have uh, plans and responses that are perhaps rehearsed and resourced that we can then roll out in the event of a future crisis? Um, Again, the track record isn't especially great from that because we had a pandemic that we were underprepared for. And now we have the invasion of the full scale invasion of, of Ukraine that we weren't prepared for. Uh, so we're still playing catch up a lot of the time. But there is an effort and a, a determination to get to better anticipatory governance. Now, one dimension of that has been the SPAS network um, and audience participation. How many of you have heard of the SPAS network? Yeah, I was afraid. I was afraid so. Yeah, very few. 
Um, and this is an interinstitutional informal network. So it doesn't have a legal entity or basis. It's an agreement uh, among the institutions to come together and, and dialogue and discuss things um, from a foresight perspective. It's been going in to some extent or, or other since 2011, became more formal in 2015, and it's still going. In fact, the present commission innovated in, norm, in, in important respects. For the first time, it designated a commissioner who had responsibility for strategic foresight. That would be Vice President uh, Shevchevich, better known here as, as uh, the Brexit, uh, the, man, the man who helped uh, resolve issues around the protocol. Um, and it also instituted an annual strategic foresight report issued by the Commission, which is a 30 page document, which is extremely well worth reading. It comes out in early summer and it's designed to feed into the State of the Union address. So when we hear the State of the Union, we kind of go back and see what, what elements were there or what, what are not there that fed into the, into the address. Um, and it also involves a much larger and more scientifically based and elaborate report prepared by the Joint Research Council, also well worth reading both these documents are public documents. Um, the SPAS process uh, includes the different institutions uh, to a greater or less degree, that is the Parliament, the Commission and the Council, and also the External Action Service. Other bodies, the Constitutional uh, Committees and the EIB are associated, as is the uh, Institute of Strategic, uh, of, uh, of Strategic Studies in Paris. Um, and we discuss matters uh, uh, informally on a regular basis. We uh, we're, we run an annual conference that takes place now on the 14th of, of November next, where we try to include high level speakers to inform a debate about what, what's coming towards us from an EU perspective. And we prepare a report every five years that's inspired to some extent by the National Intelligence Committee, National Intelligence Council report of the US, which is delivered to the desk of the incoming U uh, US president every four years. Uh, that's been going on for something like 30 years, and this has been a model or at least an inspiration for what we try to do at European level. Now, the most recent report uh, was 2019, um, and again, it's a public document, so uh, that constrains perhaps a little bit uh, the, the, the contents. But it was interesting to note that the seven themes we identified and the or indeed the order in which we identified them corresponds quite well with the six priorities of the van der Leyen Commission. This is correlation, it's not causation, but it does show a kind of an identity of thinking that the thinking in Brussels was, yes, the climate issue is now the major, the, you know, the, the first priority um, and other issues followed technology uh, and, and the issues that have been a focus of the van der Leyen Commission ever since. Um, the present report will be delivered uh, next uh, next spring for in time for the elections to inform the incoming office holders and the parliament and subsequently the commission. Um, and it is an opportunity to draw on a wide variety of perspectives, uh, <laughs> gather information and insight from a very large number of, of stakeholders and present it in digested form to future decision makers. It's, it's, it's a worthwhile process uh, for all that it's relatively low profile and it operates more at an official level rather than at a political level. One of the, yep, three, three minutes, good. Um, one of the points um, involved is that uh, the leader, leadership have a decisive role in this, but it's an ambiguous role. A leadership must step up to create capacity and scope for foresight thinking, and then they must step back and let it work. Uh, so they must authorize it, but at the same time, give it agency. Uh, if you don't have these two elements, you're struggling already. You need the leadership engagement uh, because you're essentially trying to inform their decisions, but you need freedom to discuss things beyond what's in the program for government and beyond what are the existing commitments of one or other political group. And this is a difficult uh, balancing act. A safe space is an important part of this uh, dimension. You need to be able to bring people together to discuss different points of view outside of the political arena. In the political arena, we're, we seem to be locked into a combat of structure, but it's a sterile combat. 
I have my position, you have yours. Uh, I'm not going to admit any weakness in my position. I'm not going to admit any uncertainty, anything I don't know about, and neither are my opposition. Uh, in the foresight process, you have to begin with uncertainties and what you don't know, and you have to acknowledge that other people's viewpoints need to be taken into consideration. I'd refer here to the, it was a Swedish report, the Neiman report on the banking crisis. One central conclusion of that was that one of the gaps and one of the factors that contributed to the scope of the banking crisis in Ireland was the lack of a space where professionally expressed contrarian views could be considered. And that's a, such a fundamental conclusion. It's a fundamental aspect of any element of strategic foresight and developing a, a, a genuine process for looking into future options. To move on uh, quickly to um, security issues in the remaining time, perhaps, um, a, a discussion that's based on a polarity between neutrality here and NATO there will very quickly become locked. Um, so it would be good to reframe the issue in 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 a in a broader way. What shades of uh, uh, what is the broad range of defence policy directions that Ireland might take? That's appropriate to uh, the current realities and future realities. And an important point there is that there are several possible futures. NATO itself is in the process of changing, trying to uh, understand whether it, its role will expand from the North Atlantic theatre to some global role. Uh, that's a, that would have fundamental significance for NATO's day-to-day uh, -day operations and its future uh, reality. And you know, we need to take into account the different possibilities. Uh, we should also consider what uh, a more active role or a, a more a greater dedication of resources to defence uh, uh, activities in Ireland would have for other uh, areas of budget. We should consider uh, a debate on soft power and hard power. Do these, can these complement each other? Is it a choice? If you're going to spend more on, on hard power, are you necessarily spending less on soft power? How do you balance these things if, from the point of view of making the world safer and of representing Ireland's position in the world? Uh, if, if we have... Uh, uh, if we're moving to increase defence expenditure as a percentage of GDP, should we have an equal upward movement in spending money on, defend, on, on overseas assistance? overseas assistance in itself is a contribution to making the world safer. Um, so how do these things uh, mesh together? Can you do both? Do you, what trade-offs exist? What trade-offs exist with other, other areas of policy? I think a fascinating question for Ireland is what is the role of Ireland's technological industry base in this whole area? I think that given the, the presence uh, of high technology companies of every kind in Ireland, um, certainly, it's an issue to to consider how that uh, how they would uh, uh, operate or how they could potentially contribute also to making the world safer and developing uh, both defensive and and other capabilities. Uh, plainly, Ireland has particular needs uh, that we're in, in a world that we know is more joined together. Undersea cables can we be better at detecting eventual threats to undersea cables? For example, cybersecurity can we do better at protecting our health service from the kind of hack uh, that that it experienced a couple of years ago? So there's certainly a, a key role for technology and Ireland has a very advanced industrial base in the technological area that needs to be drawn into this discussion too. Many questions. I'll just end with one point, if I may, uh, drawn from Aristotle. So th there are circumstances where, you know, you almost any option you choose is a good one. If things are going well, if the weather is fine, you know, almost all of your choices will have a good outcome. This is not the kind of world we're living in today. <clears throat> so what Aristotle said was that there are, uh, and I, I did, I did change the quote, but I want to, I want to get the, get the get the wording right. Um, to miss the mark is easy. To hit it is difficult. There are many ways to fail. There is one way to succeed. And this is where uh, we need to develop a foresight process, which will at least give us the best possible basis to get our aim correct, because we're living in a time where we need to make the right decisions and we need all the tools that can help us to make those decisions that we can mobilize. Fantastic, Eamon, thank you. I, I like how you went from very practical 
considerations of both process and things we should be thinking about. So some of that broader philosophical context, which again, I think some of our computer science friends <laughs> could benefit from a little bit of a little bit of Aristotle. Um, but as, and I, I, I love the idea of like prof uh, professionally express brace for contrarian or space for professionally express contrarian contrarian views. I think that, that, that could be a good title on Alex for the IIEA, <laughs> maybe. Um, Great. And, and so, I mean, um, Florian, I'm going to come to I'm going to come to you um, as our last panelist, and then we will be opening up um, to, to Q&A both from here in the room. And we are also being broadcast. Hello, everybody at home in in the warmth of their own <laughs> of their own home on, on Zoom. Um, and so just so you know, that that is going to be on on the record um, when we when we have the when we have the Q&A as this discussion here is. Um, and so, so Florian, so, so you run the center for uh, for the long view, for, for for the long view exactly. When and um, when I when I first read that, I was thinking of like psychohistory. I don't know if anybody is into <laughs> Asimov's foundation oh, yes. and the exactly the, the perfect mathematical formula, and you so you could tell what was happening in the future. I'm going to imagine that that's not what you do. <laughs> not yet. If you if you not have yet. that thing, I, I can't what it's called. Um, but so so what exactly is it that 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 you do. What does somebody who is a professional in strategic foresight? What do you what do you do? Yeah. What what do you do? Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, sometimes when I get introduced, I get introduced as a futurologist. Now, who of you have worked with futurologists? Was it good? Yes. I'm surprised. I I I, I hate them guts. And and. Why? Because they're making a living selling simple truths about the future, in my opinion, right? So they give you these five things that you have to take key, to keep in mind. If you do that, then you're fine. And in my opinion, that's the equivalent to populism in what we do. So the second quote or the second uh, description of what I do, I received that from the leader of our legal services in Deloitte in, in a global level in a high level discussion with CEOs. And he said, you know what you are? You are the jester of this group. You are allowed to ask the question that nobody else is asking because they're middle management, they're executives. They are receivers of this is where we go and now I have to implement it. And again, I, I, I was not sure whether I like this or not. I kind of like this description, but I would rather put forward the third description. I'm a prompt engineer. Who is familiar with this term? Prompt engineer for, for the front row here is, you know, when you work with generative AI, you have to ask the machine the right question. If you do, you get smart answers. If you don't, it's bullshit, right? <laughs> and... I'm not a prompt engineer for AI, but I'm a prompt engineer for the decision makers. That's my job. My job is to ask them the right questions. Now, I would like to, you know, just make three points about strategic foresight. First of all, what is it? What is it not, in my opinion? And our opinions vary, I, I noticed. Secondly, what is happening in, you know, around Ireland with regards to the security uh, context? that as far as I can see, and I have a very limited picture, is going to be important for you guys. And the third thing is, how can we use these new tools in making better strategic foresight? So number one, um, there's a difference between forecasting and foresight. Forecasting is, I take the data of the past, I extrapolate into the future, I build the best case around it, I build the worst case around it, but basically, I'm predicting the future from what I learned from the past. And I respectfully disagree. Knowing about the third industrial revolution doesn't give us much clue about the fourth industrial revolution, unfortunately. So what foresight needs to do is actually to take the step back and consider what are the elements of which we are certain what's going to happen, which are the trends that I can objectively measure, and which ones are the uncertainties where all the experts that I get in the room couldn't agree on, what, on what's going to happen. And it is those uncertainties that we have to work with, that we have to dance with, that we have to embrace. Because it's admitting that we don't know everything about the future that then leads to a productive discussion where I can actually admit that the other person in the cabinet room or the other person in the boardroom 
has a point with their point of view, right? And therefore, building scenarios about the future, having a productive exchange is first of all, take the step, step back, being humble about, yes, I know a lot, but I don't know any all. And therefore, I have to admit that there's a lot of uncertainty out there. So that's the first point. The second point is when we talk about the future, we are coming here from the security community. So military aspects, technology, politics is going to be top of mind. And that's fine. That's fair. However, there is also societal questions. There is the environment related set of questions that will become more and more important. So when you think about foresight and the future, think holistically about it and make sure that you have a system to get opinions and evidence from all these quarters, right? The trick that we use in foresight is we build stories about the futures, not Excel sheets with numbers and probabilities. We say this could go this way or that way or that way. And therefore we're building a logical model how those uncertainties could interact with each other going forward. And in those narratives, you have at least two big advantages. First of all, you can put together apples and oranges. You can put different elements that come from totally different quarters in the discussion and put them into a logical relationship because it's not numbers. You can say, hey, if something happens in uh, a technology field that has an impact on African economies, this will do something on my migration picture that I have here in Ireland, right? You can build this logical bridge between things that are really not very related if you think about it. And secondly, narratives are powerful. Narratives enhance the chances that this is the North Star, we have considered where we need to go, this is the choices that we make, and now I explain it to my people, to my constituency, to the people that are executing my orders. And by doing so, first of all, you increase the chances that they actually do what you want them to do. And secondly, you give them purpose, right? And therefore, there's also an element of bringing this polarized society together by having an exchange. And therefore, it's important to have in these foresight exercises, diversity of opinion in the room. The more diverse the opinions are in this initial phase where you say, let's figure out how the world around me is changing, the more robust the insights will become. Afterwards, when it comes to, so what do we do with this? And what are the policy recommendations or the orders or whatever? Then you get into the closer circle and you think about and you talk, you know, straight. So what, is, you know, the pros and the cons and here's our decisions. But in the assessment phase, think broadly. Now, um, I talked about, you know, thinking holistically about what is happening around Ireland. And here's my personal top five list. It's not representative. It's just what I picked up in my bits of the wood. So when you talk about the social uh, dimension, what speaks most to me right now is the impact of everything that is, that is digitization on society, right? There was the need about critical thinking. My fear is that the more artificial intelligence we get, the, the more stupid the people will become, actually, right? We are de-skilling, and I'm already seeing it in my consultant colleagues as we speak. They're getting lazy. They're getting think lazy. They, they say, hey, I can ask JetGPT. Great. So I don't need to write this summary anymore. And I think that's a, you know, that there's a trend. If that continues, we really have a problem because our society is aging, plus it is de-skilling, no good, right? So secondly, um, when we talk about technology, there is plenty of technologies. And the, the important bit for me here is that we are right now in a big transition from one set of infrastructure that was critical to us, say oil and gas, for example, to a new set of infrastructure that will be critical to us, say this electricity grid that we have to have to have renewable energies. And this changes the rules of the game, right? This changes what I, you know, what functions and what infrastructure I need to protect. And I think we just started to realize that, you know, I need a European electricity market, but can I count 
on the Norwegians to actually sell me electricity when I really need it, or on the Swiss, or on the French, right? So there's a whole new, new set of rules of the game. And this is where I think strategic foresight really comes in handy, not to predict what is the black swan that is going to bite us next, but to discover the, 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 the shadow, if you want, of that black swan. What are the impacts if, if something like this hits us? Okay. Um, then, in terms of economic uncertainties and trends around Ireland, I, you have a really strong digital sector, but you need to protect it. It's going to be your key economic sector, right? So subsea cables is a big topic. Um, and I think in order to protect and enhance your competitiveness as an economy, these are questions that you need to address urgently. Right. Um, environment. No, okay, now you I'm going to lose you now. But if you really think far out, and if we believe that climate change is happening, and if we agree that sudden shifts in carrying capacity will be an issue if climate zones change, I would say, have you ever considered what happens if the Gulf Stream ceases to be? Would that be a good time now to start thinking about this, even if this is a low probability or you don't want to think about it? So that's the kind of thinking I would encourage. Um, and then in terms of politics, it was somebody from the strategy department in NATO 10 years ago that started to talk about the threat to liberal democracies and really scared me. But they were right on, my, on the money. Right? And this topic is going to continue there, right? The polarization in our society, what is truth? How can I make my society resilient to these new forms of exchange of ideas and what this does to parties is I think a topic that will keep us busy for the next couple of years. Okay, last, in closure, the good news is that our world is getting apparently more and more complex, I would actually argue, no, we just realize how complex it is. It has always been complex. However, now, you know, if something happens in the Strait of Taiwan, it has direct implications here in Ireland, right? So we need to realize. The good news is we have sensors, we have big data, and we have artificial intelligence to actually help us pick this up, get the early warning signals, anticipate, get ahead of the game, right? So I would disagree that artificial intelligence is an existential threat, at least as far in my little part of what I do. I'm just quoting. Okay, say I okay, <laughs> fair. <laughs> fair, fair point, fair point. I would say it is the threat and it is also the solution. We just need to get ahead of the game, right? And with this, I, I, I think I'm, I'm going to close. My last reflection is who is the audience of strategic foresight? Is it you? the decision makers? Is it the government? Is it the public? Is it the parliament? I think the, the, the most fundamental question we need to ask is who do we need to convince, right? So strategic foresight can be an amazing tool to make this argument. We need to embark in this journey of transition. I don't know when it comes to migration or whatever big complex topic you want to choose. And here are the things that could happen. We have thought it through. Here are the scenarios. And here is my plan, what I want to do. If we manage to do that, we finally get out of this silly, stupid populist way of discussing. And that's my hope. And that's my motivation why I do it. Thank you. Thank you.